Oh crap, that sucked. Welcome back, honors. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of the rise of Western philosophy in classical Greece. But also, we're going to be getting into some other stuff right after that, right? So what's going to happen right now is I'm going to clip in a little section real quick that wraps up Plato and Aristotle because I did a really, really good job recording it actually for the academic kids earlier this year. And I just want to run with it. And I did it quick and I did it like systematically. And so it's going to help everybody out a lot, okay? So give me two seconds. Go ahead and watch that. Then you're going to jump back and we're going to start talking about a war that's going to break out between Athens and Sparta. But it's by one of my favorite artists from the 1700s by the name of Jacques-Louis David. So this moment in history is so big that people were painting it thousands of years later. But the next guy we'll talk about is this dude who is somberly sitting at the end of the, uh, the painting right there. That is no other than Plato, right? So like now, so the big guy that we'll talk about next is the guy that actually wrote all of Socrates' stuff down. And his name is Plato. He was considered the very first true philosopher. Some people are actually considering that. Like as in like he is the student of Socrates and he takes philosophy to an entirely new game where he tries to answer those questions that Socrates said that he didn't know anything about, right? So Plato, we also know though, comes from like more wealthy means, right? He was born pretty wealthy and stuff like that to a very wealthy family. And the thing about it is he ends up going and studying with Socrates for most of his young life. And he wrote 36 books in total. 36 books in total, several of them being dialogues and one of them famously being called The Republic, right? And in this process of learning from Socrates, the biggest thing he comes down to, he's like, we got to think more, right? We got to think more and we need to use logic to try and understand the perfect elements of society. Is perfection possible, right, is a big question that he asks himself. And if I, if perfection is possible, can I get anywhere close to it, right? And he said, know thyself, right? Don't worry about everybody else's opinion. Know why you believe in your opinion, right? People got, everybody says there's a famous phrase where it's just like, like, opinions are a lot like parts of your body. Everybody's got one, right? Exactly, okay? But he always said, don't follow the crowd. Don't go with the popular opinion. Do you really like the things that you say you like? Are you liking them because other people like them? And then also look inward, know thyself, and really break that stuff down. And he also used this concept of rationalism to try and understand the perfect forms of things in life, okay? Rationalism is a concept of logic, right? Just using your brain to try and work things out. Not experiments, not observations, but trying to answer unanswerable questions just using the logic you have in your mind. Now, an interesting thing about Plato is he actually believed that there were two universes, right? Okay, now this is really important. Okay, check this out. We're going to talk about it in the warm-up, but he believed that there were two universes. One ideal that is full of the perfect things everywhere, almost like heaven, right? Like he believed in a place called the ideal universe where everything there is perfect, right? There's the perfect version of this phone. There's the perfect version of this coffee cup. There's the perfect version of like a human man. There's a perfect version of a human woman. There's a perfect cat, perfect dog. Well, there is no perfect cat, perfect dog, and his name is Pierre, right? Like, so like he believed that there were these ideal forms of things and that everything here in the real world is based off that ideal of perfection and that everything in this real world should try to seek to be as close to perfection as you possibly can get and it will actually make everybody in society better. We should try to learn how to find the perfect lover, the perfect person, counterpart for ourselves, right? What is beauty, right? He actually collect, like connected the idea of beauty to a construct of love, right? He was like, no, beauty is in the eye of the beholder because that person loves this other individual. Beauty will then come naturally, right? It's objective. We believe in it in a sense. It's not all transcendental. It literally is one thing that that person believes in, right? And he believes that we should try to fix society. And a big thing he hated also, just like Socrates, he hates Athenian democracy. He thought, he was like, we we're letting dumb people rule over us and stuff like that. We are not, we should not allow people who get voted in by the masses to rule. He said we should allow the philosophers to lead. Because if the philosopher king is there, he will lead a just society. This will actually come up a little bit later on too when we talk about the Renaissance. We'll talk about a guy named Machiavelli, right? Now another thing about it though too is he opens a massive academy with his wealth and means. A huge school that he actually educates people in Athens with and anyone he could get his hands on if you could actually like afford to be there he would educate you and he would figure out a way to do it and he educated so many famous philosophers i have a painting of the athenian academy in the back of my room plato's academy is the setting of a very famous renaissance piece called the school of athens by raphael right we'll talk about it a little bit later on because right here you got plato standing right there actually socrates is in this painting too he's actually right over here bugging somebody or something like that and then another very very famous individual by the name of aristotle is standing right next to plato right there but the thing that we'll talk about a lot in class is going to be his theory of forms and this thing that he calls the allegory of the cave 
and how, you know what, democracy is pretty much bad because a lot of people like to stay dumb, right? So do me a favor underneath theory of forms and allegory of the cave, leave about like three spaces, all right? Like about three spaces, three lines, really about three lines below there so we can jot a couple things about it down in class because I got to draw something, really show it to you. Now, speaking of, though, a couple things, speaking of Aristotle, okay, we're now moving into our third philosopher, a man by the name of Aristotle, right, who apparently was born in Macedonia, son of a doctor, right, a very, very intelligent individual. And his first major career choice is going to be something really important, but he doesn't do it until his 30s. So the thing that you need to understand about it, though is he actually moves from Macedonia to Athens to join Plato's Academy, and he stays there from the ages of 18 to when he's 36 when Plato dies. And whenever Plato dies and the Academy begins to falter a little bit, Aristotle takes one of the biggest job decisions that anybody has ever heard of. He takes the job of being the tutor to the young Alexander III the future king of Macedonia, who would later on become Alexander the Great. Right? Like, so exactly. Big reason why Alexander the Great becomes the Great is because he was a smart man, tutored by Aristotle, right? He moves to Athens to work with Plato, though, before he becomes the tutor of Alexander, worked inside of his academy, and he realized a big thing. That he actually disagreed with Plato on a lot of stuff, right? His guiding ideas, there are too many to count, right? The biggest thing, though, is you have to understand about Aristotle is he studied everything, right? He actually kind of disagreed with Plato about a lot of stuff. He wanted to know the nature of all things, right? So his ideas are, like, so dense and intense. Literally, we have a hard time kind of, like, excuse me, penciling them down, right? He studied everything from art to friendship to elements. He created rhetoric styles that you have actually have heard of today known as ethos, logos, and pathos, which is how you should write, right? He said, like, look, if anybody is writing anything, you need to use ethos, which is like like ethics, right? Ethics and the, like, the value of soul and ethical value. Logos, which is logic, and pathos, meaning actually empathy, right? And so like, now look, and also the other bad thing about it is I think his biggest contribution to science and philosophy in general is this concept called empirical study, right? The thing you need to to understand about Aristotle is he's different from Plato in one key respect. Plato was like, we could figure everything out with our brain. No. Aristotle was an empiricist, right? And he believes in empirical study. We only know things we can observe, right? So for example, he would try to figure out like, why does this phone drop to this desk like that, right? Well, he'd be like, well, there must be some type of force binding it to the earth or something like that, or it's just where it wants to be, is what he would always say. He would also try to quantify animals, right? Quantify animals all the time. Be like, oh, this one has hair and this and gives birth to live children, so it must be this type, right? And then things like that. And so he kind of leads to the taxonomic system that we actually end up using, and he learns by observing, right? Aristotle's going to be really important. He's going to come up in multiple different units. But the thing about it is, is this a golden age, right? Well, the thing about it, look, really, really quick, Athens in their classical period is considered a golden age. What a golden age is, it's a time period where art, economies, and culture is at an all-time peak. Athens is expanding. They are checking all these boxes, right? They got philosophy popping up. They got 40-foot tall statues of Athena. They got the Parthenon being rebuilt. They got Pericles doing all this stuff. They got theater going blown up. But who is this making mad? It's infuriating none other than the Spartans. And what you're going to see here in about two seconds when we get into the flip next period, or when we get into our like talk next period in class, you're going to see what's going to happen. And it's going to be a big fight between the Athenians and Spartans. It's going to last decades, and it's called the Peloponnesian War. Right? So, like, but we'll see y'all soon. Exactly. Thank you, me from the past, right? Very, very nice. I really, really appreciate you talking about Plato and Aristotle and interconnecting them into the ideas of Socrates and the rise of Western philosophy. Now, again, remember, just to reiterate the fact, something that we need to make sure we know, as honors babies running around, y'all need to know that, like, those three are the kind of archetypal godfathers, if you will, the elite three early on of, like, Western philosophy, but there's going to be a lot more that pop up, you know what I mean? I think I've said Democritus now, like, a hundred times, Diogenes is a big one, but then there's all a bunch of other ones where it's like a uh, Heraclitus is a big one, the somber philosopher, Ptolemy, and a bunch of other people too. And we'll talk about those when we actually get close to the Renaissance. But now what we're going to be talking about is all that sketchy stuff leading into this entire thing. Who was all this making upset? Really, really quick, when you look at the growth of Athens under their classical period, there is one other city-state that is starting to get really, really mad. When they look at the progress across the way, looking at Athens, watching their economies grow, watching their military alliances grow, and watching all these other things kind of grow and ample their way up, none other than Sparta is going to start getting really, really mad. And as we remember from the second Persian invasion, there was a vicious rumor going around that Sparta actually was about to help the Persian, or the Persians were actually about to help the Spartans out when it comes to the growth of their, uh, like their area and then actually putting Athens down. 
All this stuff is going to lead to the Peloponnesian War. Now, look, in the long run, something that you need to understand about the Peloponnesian War is we're not going to talk about it super in depth, right? I used to teach a whole section about the Peloponnesian War when I was younger, in my younger teaching days. And then literally this one bullet point makes me really sad, speaking of, about my younger teaching days. Because whenever I used to teach this, I also used to be like, man, a 27-year-long war. That's crazy. That's older than Mr. Terry. And now I'm 35 and sad. All right, like, so like, now look, with the big thing about it, though, is, is I used to teach a lot of different stuff. And actually, the Peloponnesian War is also loosely related to Socrates' death because he actually told uh, the Athenian army to go and invade this place called Syracuse, and it was like a massive backfire, right? But this war, in general, is basically a massive 27-year-long war between Athens and its allies and Sparta and its allies. And it's all going to start mostly based on trade stuff, right? So if you look at this map right here in general, this is, of course, the Spartans. The Athenians were over here. Everybody that was a Spartan ally is over here in Greece. Green, and then, of course, uh, uh, the Athenians and their allies are going to be over here in orange, right? And so this very, very large, you could honestly argue, Civil War-style war is going to last 27 years long, and it's going to rip the entirety of Greece apart. And the two groups fighting against each other, speaking of those two different areas on that map, you've got the Delian League, which is in the orange right here, which is going to be Athens and its allies, and it's replete with a very large navy. A very, very big set, like naval set, that includes triremes by the dozens and stuff like that. And then you have another one, known as the Peloponnesian. League. And the Peloponnesian League is Sparta and its allies. And this is actually a big reason why the entire war broke out. There were these two smaller city-states that actually kind of led to the entire war starting, known as Corinth and Megara. And Megara was one of Sparta's allies, and Corinth was one of Athens' allies, and they got into a trade dispute with one another. So when those two go to fight, Athens then teams up with their allies, Sparta goes in with them. Boom! We got a 27-year-long Civil War-style war on our hands. Now, Sparta, though, unlike Athens, has a massive land army that it's very, very well known for using and has very, very superior tactics in using. Now, the thing about it, though, when we look at this, if Athens has a really, really big navy and Sparta has a really, really big land army and they keep throwing these two things at each other constantly, no one's really going to win because they honestly cancel each other out a little bit. That's why the Peloponnesian War lasted 27 long years because it resulted in what's known as a stalemate, right? Most of the war most of the 27 years of the Peloponnesian War was a stalemate. And what a stalemate is is when no side's really truly winning. It's where two sides are kind of just banging into each other relentlessly and nobody can actually get like an upper hand on anybody. And they just can't really, really get ahead or they actually can't do anything more so or actually tip the scales of the war. And so what ends up happening though is this forces Sparta to go to Persia, recruit their naval fleet, use it, and they tip the scales and they end up winning, right? And after 27 long years, Socrates is now dead. Pericles also ends up dying during the uh, Peloponnesian War as well. He dies from a flu that actually hit Athens, known as the Plague of Athens. We think it was the flu. We don't think it was like the bubonic plague or the Black Death or anything like that. But after that 27-year-long war where their famous Archon is now dead, and now also, of course, Socrates himself is now dead, Sparta ends up winning, and they literally go under, and allies or Athens begins to fall under Spartan rule, right? The thing about it, though, is this is what you need to kind of highlight or put a star next to. This conflict, because it was so long, so arduous, was such a long stalemate, and led to the death of so many people in this entire war, you need to understand that it left southern Greece in rubble, right? Several parts of Athens and their allies were destroyed. Several areas of Sparta and their allies were destroyed. And it left both sides and both parties very, very weak and vulnerable to future invasion. And that is then going to lead to the rise of the Macedonians, right? So the thing that you need to understand is we're now going to be getting into these people known as the Macedonians. And the Macedonians are these people from right up here in the northern area of Greece in the, what is now known as the Republic of North Macedonia up in this general area right there. It's actually a separate country completely away from the modern day area of Greece. But the rise of the Macedonians is going to be really, really key because they're going to be led by two very, very prominent figures, okay? The Macedonians, of course, a mountainous region in Greece which is actually uncivilized frontier, was led by two guys, Philip II and Alexander III, right? We'll get to those, who those people are in about two seconds. But the thing about it is that these two rulers, Philip II and Alexander III, looked upon their kingdom and the breadth of their kingdom in Macedonia, and most people in Greece considered them mountain people, almost the hillbillies of ancient Greece, right? Huge numbers of people, large groups of people, some settlements here and there and stuff like that, and enough people to form a really big army, but they were considered to be uncivilized by comparison to the southern Greeks when it looks at the, the ideas of like Thebes and Athens and Sparta and places like that, right? Well, what ends up going down is a king comes along, 
and is going to organize all of them together, right? And their first majestic king is going to be none other than Philip II, right? Philip II has a very bright idea on his hands, right? Him and his seven wives that he's married to and stuff like that. He also has a litany of children and stuff like that. But Philip II comes to power as the king of Macedonia, following the Persian invasions and following as well the, uh, what you call it, the Peloponnesian War, right? And when he comes to power, we're talking about the mid-300s BC, okay? He seeks to go out there and he sees the opportunity. He wants to go off and he wants to conquer Greece after the Peloponnesian War. Why would he do this? Because they're weak, right? Like southern Greece is very weak right now. Sparta and Athens fought a very long war that left them very weak and vulnerable to invasion, right? If this would have been the moment that the Persians decided to invade, the Persians might have actually taken over, right? But it's not. It's instead the moment when the Macedonians decide to invade. So he recruits a massive military made up of all those uncivilized hill people up in Macedonia and stuff like that. And he creates not only a good version of a Greek military, but an even better version than one anyone's ever seen, okay? So something you got to understand about Philip II's military that he recruited, not only did he refine the phalanx system, right? So the phalanx, of course, is that big military organization that the Greeks would use with the rows of guys, the shields, and the spears. So like Ali Mix, I know you know, remember it really, really well from class. She was like, ah, oh my God, we're going to get Mount Carmel with it. Now, like, so the big thing about it, though, in general, he refines the phalanx system and then gives all the men inside the phalanx a longer spear. They actually had 10-foot spears, and he extended them to 20 feet so they have bigger reach and stuff like that and make it even harder to actually penetrate he also recruited different types of troops as well to the actual entirety of his military he added different things like archers and he also added a very very special element to the entire macedonian military known as the cavalry right which is horseback like it's like soldiers who ride on horseback right and he also creates a professional military where they get paid for their services and philip ii is considered a warrior king of macedonia and not only did he set the precedent of creating a really intense military but he even fought alongside of his men which is a thing that he would pass down to his son as well man like of course alexander who would later on go on to become alexander the great right so that right there is philip ii and as we can notice he's got something wrong with him right there he's actually missing an eye during one of the battles when he was actually trying to take over areas of southern greece he actually lost an eye because he got shot in the eye with an arrow right and it goes like you whack and it like actually came all the way out the back